Hello everyone, my name is Stefanon, and welcome to Bedtime Stories Part 12. Yeah, it's not really a bad time right now, um, I actually just got up. Um, but I'm waiting for something, so I'm recording another episode, and here was Microsoft telling me something about virus protection and stuff, because, you know, I have an antivirus program, and... Windows doesn't, you know, like it. I don't know. Ah, that's been doing it since yesterday. Sorry for that. Alright, we have some weird kind of monsters. Juvenile stickers. Like, stickers. This one has a name. Chkkt. Chkkt. Let's talk with Chkkt. <clears throat> this massive creature looms over you, a scent like lightning, and an underground cavern washes over you, and it reminds you of nothing so much as curiosity. It chitters and rumbles, waving its large claws through an expressive dance. Something about these smells, sounds, and gestures seem familiar, a niggling itch in the back of your mind. At least you remember the taxonomy now. This is a stitious, a huge burrowing insectoid. Oh, an insect. It points to itself and says, Chkkt. It follows with another stream of high pitched noise. Uh, can you tell me about the stitcher? It scrubs briefly at the wall, and a bit of lightning flares about the crown of antennae on its head. Its shoulders shrug, and you smell dust. Hmm, what can you tell me about this place? It looks at you intently, and then its spatulate fingers begin a slow and careful dance. The sound it makes are slow chitters that rise and fall in pitch, accompanied by the smell of ozone. Good rock, full of electricity. Okay. Mm, that's all for now. So they collect electricity? The tunnel is blocked by debris, but it's loose enough that barring creature could easily push its way through. Mm -hmm. And that's what it says for everything. Okay, there there are levees and pelai, pelai, pelai. This violet skit visitant paces back and forth before the cavern's opening. It wears fine clothes that serve to accentuate the tall, sh thin crest on its head. A symbol has been painted on the crest, mirroring the insignia marked on its chest. Its clothes are finely tailored and well made. The name of the creature's race crawls to your mind. It's a Vargelin. This one has temporarily chosen to be female. Her bulbous eyes flash quickly around her surroundings before focusing directly on you. So, uh... They can choose their gender? Interesting. The council didn't send you that much as plain. Her voice is high and fluting. You were aware that this cave isn't safe, I hope. What exactly do you want? This cave isn't safe? Not unless you trust the discretion of the Stitcher, those insectoid monsters that are prowling aboard. Most people are afraid of them. Who are you? Agent and negotiator, dispatched here by the council, but that should be obvious from my clothing and my cards. And uh, I was wondering what you're doing here. I am conducting a diplomatic negotiation on behalf of the city. Unfortunately, I'm not dealing with a reasonable species. Her crest flutters irritably. I've made no progress at all. Days wasted in this miserable tunnel, and I have nothing to show my superiors. Hmm, what council do you serve? She gives you an incredulous, incredulous look. The ruling council of the city, of course. The heads of the slave families. You must be new to Sagas Cliffs. Very new. Maybe I can help you negotiate? She looks up and down, considering. Doubtful. You might have other skills I can use. The circumstances call for a new tactic, and these levies cannot do what needs to be done, nor can I. 
the Vajala nods. If you truly think you can help, let's put it to the test. She waves off the levies who flank her. Her gestures are short and choppy, sharp and irritated. It's this damnable stitcher. I speak to them, I offer, cajole, negotiate and threaten. Yet they persist in their digging and yet every day another house on the cliffs above slips into the sea. If the digging does not cease, the city itself may crumble. So here is my request. Find a way into the lair, remove their precious eggs and return them to me. These hostages shall ensure the future of the city above. She pauses. If you can negotiate a lasting settlement that does not require such drastic measures, you may also pursue that method. But I have been trying for days with no success. Making a note. I think I can help you. Good. We need to stop the stitcher before they bring down the entire substructure of the city. She pauses and lowers her voice. If you manage to infiltrate their lair, be sure to acquire all their eggs. I suspect they will have multiple clusters and we will need them all if we want to negotiate from a position of strength. She hands you a synth ball with a blinking device inside. Once you're in the lair, activate this. It will show you all the tunnels, the egg clusters, and the stitches themselves. Better know what you face before you charge ahead. Last cast off gains the cipher sickness minor fettle. Gain item pan panoramic capture ball. Thank you, farewell. So I have I gained a Cypher too much. Just give it to her. Hmm. Let's talk to Kekt again. Kekt regards you silently and then begins its pantomime. The scent of tunnels grubs and sharps metal fills the air. It is ash is as usual, its chittering makes no sense to you. It manages to choke out a few words of truth. What you want? Mm. I have come to ask you to stop digging underneath the city. Kekt waves its arms around, and the air fills with the scent of slow glowing fungus. You think it says, Why? More incomprehensible chittering follows, and then it speaks slowly and carefully. Not learn a speech? Not work us? No, not now. We dig. Okay, so we need to learn how they speak. Okay. Hmm. Can you tell me more about the stitcher? It chitters and grumbles, remain incomprehensible to you. It nods its head at you, and when you fail to respond, it trills. Talk other question. Hmm. What do you think of Pili? Pili. The stitcher seems discombulated for a moment. Who? Then it thinks a little more. Then it sprays out the blast of pheromones, and you smell the sharp tang of acid and weakened stone. It smells like distrust. You almost have the sense of the language, the structure, the feel, the sound and scent. The itch in your mind intensifies, and you can feel the memory of the stitch's language waiting to reveal itself. Ooh. Anamen Anamnesis. Try to remember how to speak the stitch's language. Ooh. That's not a lot. Can I go back? Yep. Hmm. You dig under the city, right? Can you... Uh, can you take me someplace? Over the scent of warm gravel, the stitches clicks and whistles. You understand the words, yes and shins. Hmm. What do the stitcher use shins for? It points to various items on your belt and person, and you think it's telling you that the stitcher buys items from a human. I try to remember, and we put a lot of effort in it. And I managed to remember, yeah, success! 
Your mind blurs, a memory raising up from forgotten depths. You see yourself interacting with the stitches, the two of you patiently exchanging hand signals, a small box between the two of you in translating your words and thoughts. Each time it conveys a thought or concept, the device sends a stimulus into the appropriate parts of your brain, and electricity into your limbs making you a marionette. Your muscles twitch in sympathy with these memories, and you realize that the stitch's tongue is a jumble of scent, movement and sounds. With the memory, information pours into your mind, as if a plug had been removed. The smell of granite fills your nose. As you return to normal consciousness, Kek leans forward. Kek smells granite. Knowledge. It rumbles. It spiracles when a minuscule trace of grass. The stitches looks at you and its body posture and slight movement indicate a question. Does human speak stitches? Your muscles remember and you twitch the proper response. Chkekt huffs the scent of lightning. Never speak Chkekt to human so. Heard memory from Elder, not believe. Human almost sentient. Imagine, grub think like stitches. It claps its hands together. Speak smart, better now. I have come again to ask you to stop digging underneath the city. Why? Where we go? Give reason to stop. Hmm. The humans above are suffering. When humans dig, they care for us? No, we... Why we care for him? For them? Mm-hmm. Fair point. Hmm. Let, let's try persuasion. I'm pretty bad at it. Just very bad at it. Oh yeah, that that's not a great combination here. I need to put in one more effort. Let's try everything. Oh, it worked! 40%! It worked! A lot of effort in it. Success! It considers your words for you. So, what did I say? Indigo Tide, raise the moderate amount. Moderate amount. Do you want your people to have a future? Do you want war with the humans above? They will collapse the tunnels. They will destroy you. It considers your words for a time, and the scents that surround it vary from the frightening to the mundane. At least the smell of synth and strong glass will have passed your nose, and Chkek says, Human, give good reason. Yes, did Jack comply? Making a note. It scratches the wall and Drums a pattern there. Stitcher move deeper, burrow to lesser rock, starve for human sake. Not fight with humans is better. Woo! Okay, that worked. I put a lot of effort in there. Well, I could have used. Hmm. Calistige's points. Well, hmm. Next time. I hope you have news for me. I'm looking for a pale woman named Matkina. The name is familiar, and pale humans are here, rare. One would imagine I might recall someone of that prescription. Alas, I do not. Perception. Her crest deflates and reinflates slightly as she says this, and it reminds you somehow of evasion. Deception. You are familiar with Matkina, aren't you? She holds up her hands. Only by reputation, it may be that she found employment with the council at one time. I know no more. Hmm. I have news about the Stitcher. Good news, I trust? I have handled the negotiations with the Stitcher. She lifts one foot to begin parsing, to start considering her options, and she stops. She slowly turns toward you, each eye rotating separately. She lowers her foot and turns to face you squarely and bites off each word. What did you do? I convinced the Kshek that digging deeper would be a benefit to both the Stitcher and the humans. There is no need to steal their eggs. You left their eggs with them? How we will enforce their exile without that leverage? She smooths her crest and blinks her eyes slowly. Fine. We can work with this for now. We have time to engineer another solution. She stops at... Th she stops a thought striking her. Did you promise them anything else? No. Good. Then our work here is complete and I can return to Council Tower. Bonded items. You acquired a bonded item. These pieces of equipment are powerful Numenera artifacts that go in the bonded equipment slot in the inventory screen. 
When equipped, they fuse directly to your skeleton, nervous system or organs, providing significant positive effects, but their invasive nature can also produce negative effects. You can now equip up to two bonded items at once. If your concentration skill is at the novice level, both items inflict the negative effects. If trained, to ignore the negative effects from the first item. If specialized, to shock all negative effects from the bonded items. If your skill level is inability, one of your bonded slots is locked until you improve the concentration skill. She hands you a pouch. The city of Sagos Cliffs owes you its gratitude. 150 shins and even eyes. Even eyes. Uh, are a bonded item plus one training and level perception skill. Hmm. Grants immunity to dazed and blinded. That's interesting. Has a negative effect to the stealth skill. This pipette contains a liquid of deepest fulligan, a color darker than black. Applied to the eyes, the liquid spreads evenly over the eyeball, but instead of causing blindness, it enhances the user's vision and thickness when necessary to protect the eyes from harm. The liquid does not bond with the user's eyes. It rests slightly atop of them, controlled by nanomachines that can be directed to keep the eyes in place control their thickness. The liquid can be removed by crying black tears back into the vial. Uh huh. Okay. Okay, so they move out, they move away. Interesting. They're gone. Let's check this. Where is the bonded item? Inventory? Character sheet? No. Bonded? Ah, okay. Let's see the character sheet. I'm already on perception here. How about here? Yeah, we give it to her. Can I give it to her? So now, her perception is one more. Oh, that's good. She has a bonded item. My tide is blue. The blue tide represents wisdom, reason, and enlightenment. People attuned to this tide seek information in the preservation of knowledge in all forms, whether scientific or spiritual. Scholars, teachers, and guides and mystics are often attuned to this tide. Hmm. Okay, they're supposed to stop that. Go in there? Okay. There's a headless man. I wanted to talk to a headless man. I really need to. Oh, he just says brar. Rough. Okay. So he can't, he can't even talk. Mepa? Mepa. What about this guy? What is this? This fat is filled with wriggling reptilian tails knotted and tangled together. Now it's a swollen mass of wet glistening muscle quivers in the vat, and that's hundreds of leathery wings flutter against each other like they're trying to escape. They grow has haphazardly when sprouting from the next. Uh-huh. Let's talk to Mepa. From a distance it looks as if this mutant is wearing a form fitting suit of finely patterned lines in white, yellow and pale blue. On close examination, it becomes apparent that those are tattoos. They cover nearly the entire of his body, entirety of his body, even his shaved head. His actual clothes are simple and worn, and his boots look as though they have seen hard use. He is studying the meaningless swirls and whorls on his arm, amounting, amounting names that mean nothing to you: Solvi, Biland, Urgao, Tentries. When he looks up at you, you see that a strange device covers one of his eyes. A deep blue light shines in its center, and it seems to measure and evaluate you as he focuses on you. He smiles as you approach, a broad, beaming grin that says he considers you a friend already. I am Mepa, he says, extending his hand. I've been everywhere around here. I found my way into places long sealed and best forgotten. Met all sorts of people, he frowns. Can't say that I cared much for some of them. It's true. His voice is fast, insistent and incisive. Still, I try. The communities of our world are islands of light. Sometimes they wink out and sometimes they flare up. I want to link them together. I want to be a bridge. 
You say you want to be a bridge? How do you even do that? Okay, he's taking it quite literally. He shrugs and a faint smile on his lips. I travel, I see places, I map them out of my skin, and maybe inside me, I don't know, I mean, the lines change when I look, and they've got to be stored someplace, right? He scratches his bald head, the lines flow under his fingers. I just need to collect places, I need to know that I've done something, making maps is all I know. It's all I want to know. Hmm. I'm looking for a woman named Matkina, do you know where I can find her? Making a note. Matkina, the White Death? I've heard of her. I know where she hides too. She grins he grins wide and exposing a mouthful of extraordinarily white and clean teeth. Interesting. I can tell you where she is, but I hate to say it comes with a price. Much as I love to talk about my travels, I need to finish a patch of my Saga's Cliffs maps. And I need bragging rights for the next time I see the navigators. Also, she might not be happy I've told. But I might be able to find you to have you find it for a trade, of course. He drops his voice. Have you ever heard of the Changing God, Savior of Sagas Cliffs and times past and so forth? They say they had he had a sanctuary under the city, a place he used to retreat to and plan for the future while he thought on his past. You know, making possibly maps. That sanctuary is the one important place I haven't seen in Sagas Cliffs, and I need to fill in my map. As far as I can tell, it's not far past the stitcher there. The problem I'm having is that I just can't make any sense of their language. Maybe you can talk to them. He shrugs disarmingly. To be honest, I feel like I've done everything already. It's a hell of a price, I know, but there it is. If you want to find my Kina, you'll find the sanctuary for me. Um, why don't you go look for the sanctuary yourself? Well, no, wait a minute. I'm not gonna answer this, really, because, um... If I find the sanctuary myself, I will also have something to go to. So it might be beneficial to find it for me as well. Hmm... Is there another, some other way to the sanctuary besides the stitcher lair? He sighs, excess, exasperated. There must be. Changing God wasn't the kind of person who just put one entrance into the place, but I haven't been able to find the back door of the life of me. Hmm. I'll be back when I found the sanctuary. So when I get there first, it's actually better. So I'll uh, yeah. I wanna find this sanctuary to be honest. There's still a couple of people that I still want to talk to in here. That was definitely one of the interesting ones. Of course. That one is interesting. Let's let's interact with this one before. A dark sphere inhabits almost every socket in this obelisk that stretches toward the cavernous ceiling. No one else seemed to be paying the old structure any attention. Like most Numenera, it's simply here. And if I can't be used, it's treated as part of the scenery. The orbs gleam in the dim light. You lean toward them. Are they glass? Jewels? Eyes? Perception. A flicker from one of the orbs above you catches your eye. You look up just in time to see the image of a woman leaning toward the surface of the glass from the inside. Touch the nearest sphere. The finger barely grazes the glass before it displays the image of a furred creature touching the surface from the other side. Purple vines studded with veins of light hang from the branches of the trees behind it. If you lift your fingertip and darkness swallows the creatures. The orb is a park once more. The, orb appear, the orbs appear to reflect whatever action is performed in front of them. Hum a little song. Nothing appears in any of the dark orbs. Instead, the whisper of many voices joined in song curls from the obelisk. So low that only you can hear it. Hmm. Make a rude gesture. You make the most obscene gesture. You can think of it, the glass. A young woman with rainbow pupils appears in a glass, flickering her fingertip across her chin. She nods, grinning as if imagining your shock at her daring. Feel, feel better, dear? Hmm. I make an even ruder gesture at the structure. 
The rainbow-eyed woman rewards her gesture with one of her own. She jabs a finger at her knee, grinning at her own audacity. Tell the orb a secret. With your lips nearly brushing the surface, you whisper a thought you've never told anyone. A too tall, narrow-hipped being, a visitant, appears in the glass. Long fingers clasped, meeting your eyes. It speaks words you cannot hear. That's interesting. What a weird orb. Anyway, the red tide. The red tide is something that's really weird. A pair of gauntlets sits on the table. They look as though they are intended to provide real-time analysis and physical mentoring of any human arm placed inside. Okay, I guess we have seen almost everything here. Almost. There are a couple of people that I still want to talk to, but I also want to find the sanctuary. And I want to s know what's up with this pile of blood. Alright, this was part 12, and I wish you a very happy day, or night. Um, see you in part 13. Goodbye.